There are more high growth businesses started at 55 plus than there are under 35. The pandemic pie project, come and get a free pie. And people started coming and it kind of exploded from there. So we're gonna stir our glass, swirl it around, and then take a big smell. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Lennox. Has the pandemic given you too much time on your hands? Maybe you've lost your job and need a source of income, or perhaps you want a cottage industry that can keep you busy after retirement. The side hustle is a growing part of today's professional world and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down. So how do you turn your hobby or passion into a moneymaker? On today's show, we'll be talking to small business experts and emerging entrepreneurs about their five to nine jobs. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Side gigs are becoming more popular, with more and more Zoomers jumping on board. Whether it's to monetize a hobby, master a new skill, or simply bring joy, Canadians are finding creative ways outside their nine to five to do something that's fun and financially fruitful. According to a new study, over 3.5 million Canadians now say they have a side hustle and a whopping 84% of side hustlers are happy they made the leap. For Zoomers, a majority say it's to earn a few extra bucks for leisure. Where it gets interesting is when that side hustle takes off. You might just pursue it full time. David and Sandra, thank you both for being here. Now, Sandra, let me start with you. For someone looking to start a side hustle, what is the first thing they need to know? What do you tell your clients? Well, have a plan. Uh, the most important thing is to know what it is you want to do and how to get there. A bit of a roadmap. And you don't need a full 1,700-page business plan with glossy pictures and graphics. You need something that says what it is you're going to do, what is the opportunity, what is the pain point that you are addressing to your clients and customers, who are they? How do you reach them? And how much is it going to cost? And will it be profitable? And you can do that pretty quickly. You can sit down and think that through in a couple of hours, but it's absolutely essential before you get started. And then once you get started, David, how important is e-commerce to, to that plan? I think it depends on the type of business that you're in. For a service-based business, e-commerce may not be that important, but I think it's important to have the right tools. And so tools like Wave, the company that, that I work for, allows a service-based business to create invoices, have all their books managed, be able to get paid online. Whereas a business that's in e-commerce may use something like a Shopify or a Squarespace to set up a virtual store. So I think it's worthwhile to understand what type of business am I, am I in and it's likely that there are tools that are custom fit for that type of business. Well, Sandra, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people may not be familiar or comfortable using an online platform. Let's say you had a product that you were looking to sell. Is there another way that you can get it out to the world other than online? What do you tell your clients? Well, really online and social media is such a wonderful way to get the word out there. Um, there are a number of uh, resources that you can use that will help you to figure out what your sales channels might be and how to really fine tune your marketing. There are books out there for seniorpreneurs, which is what we're calling them, maturepreneurs, and um, join groups. Uh, peer mentorship is a wonderful source of information. People like you uh, who are really in their second, third, or fourth careers and have decided that they want an entrepreneurial career to follow their passions or just to have a, a little bit of money coming in, extra money, but talk to those people who have been through it and have some ideas that they might want to share with you. So David, then for somebody who's looking to start a website, how do they set up a simple and effective site that works for them and can maximize profit for them? Yeah, the, the amazing thing is that we're living in a time where the tools that are meant for businesses are really matching the tools that we've become so familiar with in our day-to-day -day lives as consumers. So. When you're, whether you're just setting up your first invoicing uh, management system or a website, I think what we'll find is we're actually quite familiar with the way that these tools are set up. They're set up knowing that this is typically a side hustle or the first time that someone's getting into business. It's already 
very difficult to be a master of the craft that you're in. So the expectation is that you don't know how to set up a website. You don't know how to set up a beautiful looking invoice. So the, the tools are really actually custom built for that type of perspective. So I think the worry about, am I going to be able to do this should really go away once you actually see that they're, they're really made for someone in this position. Exactly my next question, Sandra. David touches on the worry, the fear getting, you know, the fear of doing this, setting in, you know, you think you have this great idea and all of a sudden you have these negative thoughts that maybe I won't be able to do it. How do you push past that? Really, the courage that it takes to leap into that next phase is considerable. But there's a statistic I just came across that's very heartening to me and I think would be for most people. There are more high growth businesses started at 55 plus than there are under 35. So following your passion, following your bliss, taking a chance and seeing if somebody else is as interested as you are in the outcomes and seeing if you can monetize it at all, it's, it's kind of a big adventure. And if you look at it as that, then it's less scary and, and a lot more fun. And that's really the whole idea. And David, how do you know that that, that, that passion is worth pursuing? Well, I think that first customer, that first product sold is a pretty magical moment. So you don't have to go far to ask a, an entrepreneur, or small business owner who's turned that, that passion into a, a business to explain what it's, what it's felt like to, to see your, your craft, your dream come into reality. So I think the, the experiences speak for themselves, but also in terms of what we've seen over the last year, by, by circumstance, we've seen so many small business owners have to start something where their previous vocation or the previous opportunity wasn't made available to them. And, and, and what they've been able to do during this time and, and help their family, help their friends, help themselves, uh, it, it's, it's truly remarkable. So I think there's lots that, that point to just how worthwhile it is. And David, I'll, I'll continue with you here. Uh, what are some things you need to be mindful of when it comes to sort of the financials of a business? Well, I think first is making sure that you have an effective system of record and you're organized. And the, the beauty of it is today, what used to require hiring someone to do or, or lots of paperwork is all digitized. And so the, the cost of being able to be organized has become almost free. And, and it's, it's, it's an amazing step there. The second is the, the image of le legitimacy and, and professionalism. And you want the, the tools that you're using to, to speak to the quality of, of what you're producing or what your, your service is. And, and this for a small business owner to be both organized and look professional and have the, the quality of their product represented in the, the tools that they're using um, is, is great. All right, well, when we come back, how one man started a successful side hustle doing what he loves, crocheting. We'll talk to him next. I just started crocheting things that uplifted me like butterflies and flowers and pretty colored things. <laughs> Welcome back. Sean Silver is a renowned Irish dancer and dance teacher living in St. John's who's turned much of his free time into crocheting everything from decorative butterflies to hats and face masks. And he joins me now. Hi, Sean. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Marisa. Thanks for having me. So let me just ask, did COVID impact your nine to five? And if so, how? Well, I'm a dancer, so my nine to five is generally, um, you know, spent choreographing and rehearsing and then teaching classes in the evening. I've toured with a bunch of shows, so that whole nine to five becomes day to day, week to week. Yeah. But when everything shut down last March, of course, like many of us, I had a lot of time in my hands. And um, I come from a family of tailors. My fathers, my brothers, um, all of my sisters are in a family business. So sewing and crocheting and knitting was always around me. And it was some of my first, some of my first language was dancing and, and, and sewing, crocheting. Well, I was just going to ask, what was the impetus for turning this into a business for you? I, I was, you know, getting in, inquiries one by one from individuals to make this or that. And um, I finally had so many things around me that uh, I had to set up a, a Facebook page. Now, last year in St. John's, Newfoundland, we had snowmageddon, a really hideous snowstorm. <laughs> yes, I remember. Right, so it was pretty. It was pretty tra traumatic, actually, <laughs> and and um, 
you know, the bleak winter and the hard time, then on top of that COVID, I just started crocheting things that uplifted me like butterflies and flowers and pretty colored things. And uh, it, it really sort of filled up my, my, my world and my room, literally. And um, I, I started to just really sell it. So maybe you can show us a little bit of your craft? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, crocheting is, is, you know, it's really not that difficult. It's, it of course, looks you know, there difficult. Are a few it looks difficult. It looks so intricate and beautiful. Well, there are, so this really is just the beginning of, of a butterfly, you know, so believe it or not, this would actually, you know, I'll finish off a little decorative tail to it. It'll flip around and eventually you will see one of these, you know, lovely little butterflies. I um, what I like is that it takes just a short amount of time, a half an hour and a couple of stitches and you've got this little butterfly. But on top of that, um, I have these sort of little kind of sculpted pieces as well. So I, I've kind of gone a step further and I've taken the crochet and I've really built it and I've put some layers of epoxy on it and I've made these little sort of sculptures as well. So I, I enjoy that. I mean, dishcloths and, and you know, hats and slippers are fun, but I really enjoy making art as well, so. Well, and I was going to say, what is it about crocheting that you love, um, that feeds your soul, if you will? Well. For me, there's a beginning and an end process, and I and I like to. I'm a results-oriented person, so, um, and what I love is um, the element of creating something from nothing, weaving some thread together. Can you show me a simple stitch? Absolutely. So right here, you'll see this. You'll see this tiny little piece that I've got going here. And if you look at it, it's almost, it's almost the shape of a heart. This is taking on the shape of a, of a little heart. So, you know, anybody who crochets and knits, they know that there's a, a single stitch, a double stitch, these types of things. So really all I do is, you know, all you do is just take, take a few minutes, a couple of simple stitches there, you know, so you're, you're building it up. This yeah. is gonna sort of loop around. You're gonna create that little piece of, a heart. Um, this is a little piece that I've sort of built up a little further. You can see now it's taking a sort of a shape. Uh -huh. So you can kind of give this a little tug right in the center. You can continue building around it and you're getting the pieces of a heart. These little things have to be stretched out overnight. Um, you know, people purchase all of these things, which I understand because we're marketed to everywhere we turn, but Something as simple as a blocking board, we call these things. So you take a little blocking board and you put your piece onto it and you just you pin them on. Now, I use cardboard. You don't have to spend $20 on a stretching board. You just need some cardboard and imagination, <laughs> really. So this was a little butterfly I made last night. It's actually for uh, one of your, one of your um, well, Siobhan Grenny. Who, yeah. who's they're working with this, this is for Siobhan. <laughs> so you can see that it's pinned on. I'd stretch this out overnight. And again, all of these things are available to us. This ball of yarn, it's $4. Wow. Um, you know, the crochet needle is probably $4. And I can produce these little things that I can sell for $65. And- um, That's a pretty good margin. You know, it's a pretty good margin. <laughs> because you know it, it these would you know they take a bit of time um and a bit of artistic value i don't follow patterns i create my own patterns so you know i am an artist and, and i enjoy creating that element so and so that, that's really that well and where are you selling your product if if our audience wants to support you and they want to see some of the other work that you've done where can they find you well i'm at um i crochet on facebook um so it's, it's pretty simple. And I, I was, you know, listening uh, about, you know, the website, setting up websites. And you know, there are all sorts of costs involved with all kinds of things. My, my, biz, my side, other side gig as a dancer, it's I dance. And when the, when the pandemic happened, I pivoted and I crochet. So Facebook is free. You can, you can purchase ads. So I like to do that. And um, I, I like to put my work out there. And um, I crochet NL. Um, is is uh, I crochet and at gmail.com is my uh, email and I crochet is my Facebook page. And will you keep this up ap after the pandemic hopefully oh, comes to oh, an yeah. end? Yeah, absolutely. Um, crocheting for me has always been a pastime. It relaxes me. 
I, I have quite a bit of energy to burn off. So if I'm not dancing it, I'm sitting down and I like to create. And uh, it's always been a pastime for the past, you know, many, many years. All right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Coming up, a side hustler who flips sidewalk castaways and thrift store finds her story next. So this one started with red, and then I kind of put a nice egg blue on it and some white. Welcome back. My next guest started a side hustle to feed her soul. Sarah Derning is an accomplished, inclusive designer in the digital financial sector. She started refurbishing sidewalk castaway furniture that her husband would bring home as a side project. As she explains it, it's a creative outlet that pays for her shoes. Sarah joins me now. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. I also love shoes, so we have that in common. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did you get started doing this? Uh, so I came out in 2014 finishing a master's pretty late in the game. And um, I really, at that time, needed something more hands-on, A, to fill some of the time, but also as a creative outlet. Um, and so I really started with my own furniture. We had this really dark wooden furniture in our bedroom and I'd always really hated it, but it was French, French provincial. And I thought, okay, I, I heard about Annie Sloan paint, chalk paint. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give it a go. And I was hooked. I did Paris gray. It's beautiful and airy. I did a little bit of shabby on it. Um, and that was the start. From what I understand, this is a project that feeds your soul, not so much your finances. You have a very high profile Correct. job, if you will. Um, so how do you balance those gigs? How do you balance all your responsibilities every day? Oh, that's a great question. So I don't really see this as a responsibility. It's the joy of my day. Um, during the week, you know, sometimes I'm tired in the evening, so no. But um, as we head into the weekend or I've got a day off, I love getting either inside or outside of it's a nice day and um, picking up a piece uh, and continuing to paint it and see what evolves from it. Um, actually, I've got now three pieces sitting out there and I will say that they're from the garbage. My husband did a good job this week finding uh, some great pieces. Uh, not too much repair because you know I, I'm, it takes time and I'm not really into it and I need to rely on him more. Um, it's a fairly small, compact piece. I live in Leslieville, so I do sell it at the Leslieville market. In Leslieville, the homes are smaller, so I wanna make sure I've got smaller pieces that um, will fit in homes. And I'm also looking for pieces that um, sometimes are multi-purpose, because again, we don't often have much space, so where can you store books and hide things in it um, and get the most out of that piece of furniture? So you're picky. Um... Can you show us a little bit about? <laughs> yes, <I'm... laughs> Can you show us a little bit of what you've been working on? Sure. So this time, um, you know, you never know where the find's going to come from. It has to be a good price. This one I picked up from Value Village. You may not be able to see it very clearly, but what it is and really attracted me in here was there's some uh, patterns and interesting. Um, um, flowers and stuff that are happening in here yeah. and so what I did is I I never know where it's going to end up so I thought you know what I'm gonna because it's dark I'm gonna paint it white so I put on the Annie Sloan paint with Annie Sloan or any chalk paint what's amazing is people sand and stuff to get the shabby but I just use a wet cloth and because it's very uh, granular this paint if you just rub a little bit hard you know it starts coming off and you can start seeing some of that pattern coming out. Oh, yeah. Um, so I start, yeah, so I start with that. And then um, I know we wanted to talk about waxing. So one of the things um, with chalk paint is it dries really rough. And also if I start touching that, it's gonna start rubbing off. So you either need to put a, you need to put a coat on to protect it. What is it that influences whether or not you decide to wax a piece? Well, in this case, I'm waxing because of the pattern on it. I think that um, we'll get a nice look uh, coming out and, and the pattern underneath will come through. Um, the look uh, wax gives you is more old kind of look. 
Um, and and it also um, will bring out something, as I said, with lots of crevices and, and detail in it. Cool. Now, when you use wax, it's really cool. You can, I now, if it was a flatter piece, would use a cloth. Uh, there are lots of brushes out here you can buy. Um, but you know what? You don't have to spend it today. I'm using a toothbrush. There you go. Uh, and yeah. And so, you know, one thing I was really scared when I first did my first piece because black, you know, oh my gosh, what if I don't like it? But I'm so relaxed now. It doesn't <laughs> matter if you don't like it. You will repaint or um, what's really cool with um, waxes is that you can actually use the clear wax and it will um, take it off. Now, I don't actually like what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so what will probably happen is that, you know, I will try different things, keep repainting it until I get uh, a layered, more deeper look. And I can show you that in a moment. One of the things with waxes and why it's more work is once you put it on, you actually have to end up polishing it, right? Oh. Um, and and you'll know when you when it's right, when it's kind of shiny and also not sticky anymore. Um, well, so and we're you asking you going. to we're asking you to do something in a few seconds that would probably take you a lot of time to do. I mean, how long would it typically yeah. take you to wax a, a something like that? So that little piece probably would take maybe up to an hour, um, depending if I didn't like it and I took some off and I tried different techniques before I knew which one I fully wanted to go with. Okay. But here's, here's a finished piece. And what I will probably do with that. the first piece I showed you is that I will put layers on. So this one started with red and then I kind of put a nice egg blue on it and some white, and then I used a clear wax on it. And so what it does is it gives you a rich, a sort of leathery look, um, you know, when, you, when you're finished. Awesome. Well, do you think that this will become sort of a scalable side business for you? Could you see yourself leaving your nine to five and doing this full time? So, yeah, eventually, I mean, I love the transformation that happens from a piece of furniture that it could end up in landfill. The idea of saving it also those, the, the, the furniture that's been thrown out, my gosh, they don't make that like that anymore. So I can see that that's, that's a great thing that I can do all the time. And then, you know, ideally uh, now selling it online. And uh, again, I love the in-person social interaction of the Leslie Fee Market. And what advice do you have for others looking to do the same? So ultimately, um, it's something that brings you joy. And why not just start with something for yourself and see where it goes? I mean, ultimately, this um, blossomed from my own furniture. My husband said, look, enough. No more in-house, no more wood in here is going to be painted. So I had to keep going and find other pieces. And then that led to, you know, people wanting to buy them. Um, and so it just evolved from there, from my love and joy of my of, of first pleasing myself. That's awesome. Thanks, Sarah, for coming on and for sharing your story. Thank you. There's more side hustle stories when we return. The pandemic pie project, can we get a free pie? And people started coming and it kind of exploded from there. Welcome back from the get-go. Bradley Harder called his community-minded baking efforts the Pandemic Pie Project. He started making pies to thank hospital staff, but he couldn't get his sweet treats to frontline workers in any official way. So he started giving them away to people who needed a pick-me-up or couldn't afford the extras. Bradley joins me now. Hey, Bradley. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How did the Pandemic Pie Project come about? Well, it started out when the uh, pandemic hit. Friends of mine would pick up groceries for me because I'm a bit uh, immunocompromised, so I would not go out of the house. And friends would pick up groceries and bring them over to me, and they wouldn't accept money for them. So I felt guilty, so I'd bake them pies. And then uh, from there, I just started baking pies. I had about 30 pies on my table, on my dining room table. And I thought I'd box them up and bring them over to the uh, Michael Guerin Hospital 
just down the street. I went there, I called them and they said they couldn't accept me because they were picked in, in, in a commercial kitchen. Hmm. So I, I put an ad on, I just posted on Facebook that the pandemic pie project, come and get a free pie. And people started coming and it kind of exploded from there. How many pies have you made to date? Uh, 1,470 some ah! pies. Hmm. The idea was to do an altruistic uh, effort and uh, help people through the dark days that we were experiencing. Your sweetheart. All right, well, what kind of pies do you make? I make uh, mostly honey crisp apple, um, wild blueberry, and strawberry rhubarb. So where do you get, where do you start? Show us. Well, I start with a piece of dough. Um, what I'm going to do today, I already baked the honey crisp apple so we can show the miracle of uh, TV. But I'm, I'm going to do a um, blueberry. You, cut, you take the dough, you want to keep it cold as long as you can. Do you so make your the, own dough? I do. And it's uh, five cups of flour, uh, three quarters of a pound of butter, half a pound of lard. And um, that's the key, lard. Yeah, yeah. Keep it all cold. Work with it cold because if it gets warm, then the butter melts and you lose those beautiful flaky layers that you want in your pie. So you roll it out. I've started selling the pies um, recently, and uh, that's how it's turning into a business. Because I really, I've, I've been a musician for the, the past 30 years. Well, I was just going and to I, ask did COVID impact? Oh, have any did. impact on you? Well, yeah, because I obviously all the gigs have dried up, right? There's, there's nothing left out there for musicians. It's kind of sad. So you just cut off any, any big pieces of excess dough. Give me one second. Just to grab the blueberries here. Frozen blue, blueberries are good. Wild woodland blueberries. They freeze them at the point at the height of perfection. So. So those are better than fresh? Well, you just can't get fresh ones right now. But yeah, they're, they're, they're just as good as fresh anyway. When did you learn to bake, Bradley? I come from a Mennonite family. I'm the baby of 13 children. And um, my mother was a baker. My sisters all bake. And uh, baking is just part of my DNA, actually. <laughs> I love to bake, but I also well, love I just... to eat those baked treats. So maybe that's why I like to bake so much. Now, baking, they say baking is a science and cooking is an art. So then you just a little bit of sugar with the blueberries, you just throw them in there. Make sure you pile lots of them in there because you don't want to cheap out on this good stuff. So when you go back to, to singing, will you continue with the Pandemic Pie Project? I think so, because you know what, I like it. It brings a lot of joy to people. And uh, I think we just have to be nicer to our fellow man. Now you take a bit of egg wash, go right around the circumference of the pie. So now you, you roll out your lid, lay it on here. I make this look easy, but I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Do you cut slits in it? There you go. I do, do better than that. This is looking like a yummy pie. I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product. Oh, you'll see in a minute. See the magic of television. I know. It'll morph into an apple pie. You should have dropped dropped one off earlier. I could eat it for our audience. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wish it, you know what? That would have been a great idea. <laughs> it looks so good. Okay, then I just take this little device. It's a cannoli roller. Yeah. I've got a little circle on the top right here. What's that for? For making cannoli. Oh, no. I'm no. cutting the... the... Oh, oh, that's to vent the steam out of it so the pie, so the pie doesn't get all soggy. Got it. And then you throw it into a 375 degree, oh, sorry. Got the final step, the egg wash on top. Gonna paint it on there. Mm. Ooh, yeah, yummy egg wash. That'll make it brown nicely. 
Is uh, this pie, uh, has this pie been claimed? This one has not. Do you want the blueberry one or do you want the apple? I don't know. Oh, I'm, what a I'm, tough decision. I'm gonna throw this one in the uh, oven, which has been creating. Right, let's oh, see the final it. product. Looking honey good. Crisp apple. That's the apple? Yes, that's honey crisp apple pie. Your your house just must smell heavenly all the time. Pretty much. I mean, when I'm not cooking pies, I do stuff like render duck fat, so it smells like delicious duck fat in here. It's my favorite air <laughs> <of> freshener. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bradley. Well, it was such a pleasure meeting you, and I look forward to trying that pie. Okay, wonderful to meet you too, Marissa. There's more after the break. Stay tuned. So we're going to stir our glass, swirl it around, and then take a big smell. Welcome back. My next guest worked in the live event sector and was finishing up sommelier studies when the pandemic hit and shut her industry down. So she started on Instagram offering to host virtual wine tastings as a way to bring in some cash, and it's taken off. Alana Stewart-Young joins me now. Hi, Alana. Hi, Marissa. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Tell me a little bit about your business. Well, events by Alana came because of uh, the lockdown here in Toronto. Restaurants are not open and event spaces are not open. Um, so I decided to use my wine background and uh, also to support local businesses. So I launched a, an events company that focuses on blind wine tasting. So you don't know what the wine is. And all of the products that I, I offer are from local bottle shops and restaurants. Uh, with a food pairing element as well. So it's a great way to support our local businesses and learn about wine at the same time. And would you drop off these products to your client's house? Is that how that works? So I create a deal with the business and I pick up the products myself, portion out all the samples, and then I deliver them personally um, to your home. So you must be busy. I mean, how busy are you? We do um, an event a week, a public event a week. Um, and then I also do private events as well. So if people want to do something for a birthday or just a group of friends, um, those are something that I can do as well. But at least once a week, I'm doing an event. I love that. All right, well, take, take me through one of your sessions. So when you're tasting a wine, and Marissa, you have some wine with you as well. Maybe we'll start with our, our white. All right. There are three sections to tasting a wine um, that professionals go through. The first is the sight, the second is the uh, nose or the smell, and the third is the palate or the taste. So I'll go through the first one um, and just give you some ideas. And then maybe our red wine, you could tell me how you feel about the wine or what you're getting. Okay. Uh, so first, we're gonna look at the wine um, and see, uh, it tells us a few things just by looking at it. It tells us, is it a sparkling or still wine? It tells us the color of the wine, so white or red. And it tells us a little bit about the clarity. So for this one, we can say it's obviously a still wine. Um, it is a white wine. And the color, it's very clear. You can see right through it. There's no sediment. Um, and I would say it's a yellow straw color. The second component we're going to do is the smell or the nose. So to do this, it's really important to aerate or get oxygen going in your glass. Because when you introduce oxygen, you can smell more. It's like flavor molecules coming out. So we're going to stir our glass, swirl it around, and then take a big smell. When you're smelling, you just want to get your first impression. So you want to look for fruit, non-fruit, and any other little things that you might smell. So for this one, I'm smelling like buttery popcorn. I'm smelling some oak here, some vanilla. And there's also a really nice um, lemon citrus note and some minerality to it as well. Your your smell is much more sophisticated than mine. I do. I can I can get this the oak. I don't know about the butter pop. Well, actually, no. I can I can smell some butter popcorn. And the next one is the taste. When we taste wine, we also want to inhale some air, which is why sommeliers do that kind of obnoxious like swishing sound when they're um, tasting, because when you're introducing oxygen, you're introducing flavor. So we'll taste the wine next. So let's do that. And you want to swirl it. You spat yours out. I drank mine. I you go ahead. But um, for me, because I taste so much, 
to keep my head in the game, I have to spit it out. Wouldn't be very professional of me otherwise. <laughs> um, I shouldn't so the, that. Exactly. So the taste uh, for me, um, we're going to line up. So does the nose, is does it match with the palate? So is it just as intense or does it diminish? Is it as fruity as it tastes or is it less fruity? These are other things that can give us hints about the wine. So for me, the palate tastes very similar to the nose. It has that oakiness, that butteriness. Um, and also it's quite dry. You know, it's not a sweet wine. It's definitely dry and it's clean. So from here, we would do our initial um, conclusion. So we would guess maybe a few different grapes and maybe some places that it could come from. And then the final step is just naming your answer. So I think it's this grape from this region. And then if you want to get kind of nerdy, you could say the, the vintage. But usually in my tastings, we just say if it's maybe a young wine or an aged wine, because it's more introductory. So for this, I would say it's a Chardonnay because it's oaked. Chardonnay is a, a grape that's very much oaked a lot of the time. And I would say it's a new world, probably from Canada. Obviously, I know what the wines are. So this one is, and then we do a reveal at the end. This is a Canadian Chardonnay. So this is a Henry of Pelham Chardonnay mm -hmm. coming from the Niagara region from St. Catharines. Um, and it's 2019. And that's basically it. So the wine tastings, we go through four samples of wine, just like that. They're a little bit longer and stretched out and there's more interaction with, with the guests, but that's kind of in a nutshell how we would taste one of the wines. That's neat. That's really cool. Well, should we try the, should we try the red wine? Sure. I'm a little nervous yeah. because I'm worried I'm going to embarrass myself. You know, no. I'll probably have all the wrong answers. So the first uh, section of our tasting is gonna be the site. So is it still or sparkling? It's still. Great, and is it red or white? It's red. Great, and then what kind of red color? Is it a ruby red? Is it more orangey like a garnet? Or is it more purpley with blue undertones? What would you say? Ruby red? Yeah, that's great. And then <laughs> do you see any sediment or is it is it nice and clean and clear? The it's wine? clear, it's clear. Perfect. So that's okay. your three stages of your site. And then the next would be the smell. So swirl your glass and then smell. Do you smell any fruit? Yes. Great. Would it be like a cherry or stone fruit or berries? A cherry? Great. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. then do you smell any floral notes or what we call non-fruit? So it could be herbs or vegetables, which it doesn't have to smell like that. It's just some things that you could smell. Oh, I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't think yeah, so, but are, maybe there is. It's pretty fruity, right? It's definitely a fruit forward wine. Um, and I would say there's a little bit of a floral component, like maybe some purple flowers on there, but it's pretty fruity. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing we would do is, is the taste. All right, I like that. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the wine is um, dry or off dry or sweet? Sweet? I would say it's dry. Just because <laughs> <you're> just <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> but the fruit is really there, right? It's very ripe fruit that we're tasting as well. But what I get is a drying sensation on the mouth which is actually from the tannins. And tannins are present in red wine. Uh, they exist because red grapes, the skins are kept on and the skins create this drying effect in the mouth. Can you gander a guess like what you think it might be just based on your own wine consuming history? Well, it's light. So maybe a Pinot Noir or a Merlot. Yeah. Absolutely Pinot great guesses. And do you think, does this remind you more of like a French Pinot Noir, something old world, or does it remind you more of like North American style? I would say North American. You're right on the money. You did it. Did so I? This is, yeah, this is another, so we like to support local. So this is a Canadian Pinot Noir as well. It might be a little bit hard to see, but this is the, there, Flat Rock Cellars um, Pinot Noir. Um, I love blind wine tastings because they sort of dismantle your preconceived notions about what wine is and what's good wine and bad wine. Um, and they get you to think outside the box a little bit. That was so fun. Well, thank you so much for coming on.
Thank you for having me. All right, when we come back, final thoughts. Welcome back. Before we go, each panelist will leave you with their final thoughts. We'll start with David. I'd say that the, the, bravery, the bravery to start a business is already there for you, and you shouldn't have fear of looking for the right tools that can help you along the path of your journey. Sandra. I think that uh, viability and profitability is pretty important. So think about your pricing strategy. Make sure it's commensurate with the market and value your work and price it accordingly. Sean. Well, um, I think for me, I, I saw at the beginning of your show, at the beginning of your show um, to get going, just just keep going. And um, I like that concept. You can you can make all sorts of fun things. They're useful. They're functional. They're practical. And um, I think if you can see it, you can do it and enjoy the process. Sarah. So start with something that you love. I mean, for me, it was furniture. I had a purpose and intent of cleaning up some of the furniture in my house. And then from there it evolved. So it gave me joy. I wanted to continue it. I actually started seeing results, but don't be afraid, like lean into it because uh, like anything, you get better at the craft over time and your, some of your pieces will never turn out and that's okay. Bradley. So my final thought I think is just to be kinder to people and uh, try and lend a hand, help people out when you can, be nice. Don't be racist, don't be, don't be mean. And don't be greedy, just help people if you can. That's all. And Alana. So I guess my final thought would just be that wine can be fun, it can be educational, and you can meet some really great people while doing these events. At the same time, if you want to support your local businesses and learn more about those bottle shops, um, this would be a great way to do that. And that's all the time we have. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.